project. The series is done in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Energy Computing Facilities, the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I'm Mosni Marcus from the Lawrence Berkeley, Ashley Barker and, um, uh, from Oak Ridge and I will be the hosts for today's webinar, Parallel I.O. with HDF5, Overview, Tuning, and the New Features. The webinar will be presented by Quincy Kozio from uh, NERSC, the National Energy uh, Research Scientific Computing Center, where he's the principal data architect uh, uh, and uh, he uh, is where he's also responsible for helping to build the software infrastructure that's needed to enable scientists to process, analyze, manage, and share data at the highest scales. Quincy, please. Ashley, you give him back the train. Done. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Ozzy. Uh, can everyone see my slide? Can you guys see my slides? Uh, not yet. All right. Reshare them. There we go. Super. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Um, my name is Quincy Koziel, and I'm going to be presenting this with Surin Baina, uh, my co-PI on the ECP XHDF5 project at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, we have a number of collaborators also at um, Argonne and the HDF group, and uh, I'd like to thank them for their uh, contributions and participation in the project as well. So today we'll be covering a um, broad set of topics, and uh, I think we, we're going to go very broad and not terribly deep, although there's a lot of slides that I've hidden in the deck if people would like to get a little bit more details. And um, if you do have any questions during the presentation, we'll try to stop and uh, gather questions and try to answer some of them as we go. Uh, if Ashley or Osni or Sarim um, can flag me down, I'm happy to stop and talk and answer questions uh, along the way as well. So at the very beginning, you, you think, oh, HDF5, people keep saying, what should I, uh, you should go use HDF5 for storing your data, but um, what is this, right? So HDF5, in some ways, is a lot like XML. Uh, it's self-describing. It's got a very extensible set of uh, rich metadata that you can uh, add all your information to, mark up, and annotate uh, your data that you're storing in your HDF5 files. In a lot of ways, it's um, designed to be as high performance and um, compact as a, a binary flat file, so your Fortran write statement for those in the 60s and 70s, 80s. Um, it's also a lot like PDF. Sometimes we call ourselves the the, uh, the PDF for science. Uh, it's a very standard exchange format. It's designed to be long-term archival and um, contain lots of different kinds of things. You, just like you can put text and images and other things into PDFs, you can put lots and lots of different kinds of things into HDF5 and move them around from platform to platform. In a lot of ways, too, the hierarchy, the, the what we call the group hierarchy in HDF5 is very similar to a directory and file system structure. Uh, it's hierarchical and it allows you to group things in nice ways that are logical for your applications and your uh, science domains. And it's also in some ways really similar enough to a, a database. It allows that random access and subsetting um, to your uh, scale data in data sets. Um, that you can uh, extract just the pieces you need and not have to uh, parse the entire file if you'd like. But in other ways, HDF5 kind of encompasses a lot of these aspects without being exactly equal to any of them. We try to take the best things and then focus them in for, for what science needs. So it's designed for high volume and complex data. Uh, we port all the way down from originally, uh, I, I would say, uh, feature phones, but now today it's smartphones, uh, all the way up to supercomputers. Um, flexible, efficient, designed to allow applications to evolve, and HDF5 um, is maintained over very long periods of time to accommodate the changes in the applications and to get your data back in 20 or 50 years when you need it. There is a very, very large uh, ecosystem of uh, applications, science teams, and supporters for HDF5. It um, 
is internationally supported broadly, uh, Europe, US, Asia, um, commercial, academic, government agencies, uh, all kinds of places that you can put data in and take data out with uh, HDF5 and, and use it to do your science. Um, there's basically three levels to doing HDF5. There's a, a file format that's designed and, and uh, a specification that's out there so people can write uh, third-party parsers if they so desire. It's a moderately complicated file format. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, most people will work with the software, uh, at least at some level, maybe not directly calling into the HDF5 library, but maybe through some other middleware. Um, but they think about things in the HDF5 data model. So that's what we're going to start with, is to look at the data model and to think, okay, what are the concepts I need to apply in order to like put data in HDF5 files? So HDF5 files are containers. They hold all your data objects. And those data objects can range from very, very tiny all the way up to full-scale terabyte or larger uh, data sets as well as the metadata that attaches to them. There's several different um, object concepts that go into an HDF5 file, a, a data set. Uh, we'll describe all these. But the data set group and attribute are kind of the primary ones. And then supplementing those are links um, within groups and then data types and data spaces that apply to data sets and attributes. And they all go in the side of the file. And these are the primary objects that we think about. The library is written in C, so we don't get real objects from like a C++ or nicer object-oriented language, but we try our best to keep it pretty encapsulated and focused in an object way. So the, the biggest thing that most people say, well, I want to put some data in HDF5. Well, you're going to put a data set in there. You're going to create an HDF5 data set to organize and contain your data set, your, your array elements effectively. Um, every HDF5 data set is a multi-dimensional array of identically typed data set el data elements. It's like an array um, that has to be consistent. It's all floats, or it's all ints, or it's all structs, or strings, or something else. But every array element is identical, and you get to choose the dimensionality of it. And that's the, kind of the payload side and the blue side on the right. And the metadata that describes that is on the left, and we have to say, well, what are the array elements? And in this case, I'm saying they're integers, 32-bit, middle and deep. Um, and what is the array size? Well, it's a three-dimensional array with dimensions four, five, four by five by seven. Um, so that's the metadata pieces that describe the actual data on the, uh, in the array. So to drill down a little bit more on the data spaces, they describe that logical uh, layout of the elements in the, in the array. Um, <clears throat> technically, you can have the trivial case of, well, this array is empty. It doesn't contain any elements. We use those sometimes for attributes. Uh, the data space for an attribute, making it null, maybe it's a flag that just indicates that this attribute was set, but no actual data needs to be carried with it. Most um, other applications will use scalar, which is a single, like a point, uh, or an array. And obviously, this is the most common one. Um, you need to describe what the array looks like. So it has a rank and dimensionality, um, the sizes of that array initially, and then how big it could get in the uh, process of your application over time. So you can, if you specify a maximum dimension size that's larger than your current dimension sizes, you can extend out to that size. And any or all of the dimensions in HDF5 on uh, those arrays can be unlimited. So you can make a three-dimensional array that's extensible in all three dimensions and then add on to length, width, and height over time uh, should you need to do so. Very often, this is most used for applications that have a time sequence that make one dimension be the unlimited dimension, and then they add slices or cubes um, or just records onto their, uh, their arrays in the data sets. So like I say, these get used as the spatial description for data sets and attributes. And when we do IO to do part of a data space, um, we call it a selection. And we use the data space to be the kind of wrapper around what the selection description is. And in this case, we're saying, hey, we have a, um, 
one dimensional data space that has 10 array elements in it. And we want a subset of that that starts at element five and is three elements long. So this is a very trivial one, but that's the, the general concept. Data types describe those individual elements in, in the data set. They have to be homogenous across the entire data, uh, data sets uh, array. And there's a very broad uh, range of data types that we support, your typical integer and float. You make enums out of your uh, values if you wanted to say something more specific like C's enums, uh, red equals two and green equals four and blue is six or something. As well as a bunch of extra, slightly more complicated data types uh, that describe um, additional concepts in, in uh, maybe your application or that you just need for some particular application you're using. Um, arrays, you can define your own 17-bit floating point type if you feel like it's necessary. Uh, variable length sequences, um, and typically those look like strings and vectors in C++, or structs um, that we call compounds in GFI. So as I said, these describe the individual data set elements in those data sets or attributes. Um, how did we restart this slide? That did not work. Okay. Um, so this is a simple data set. Um, the metadata says, hey, the, my data type is a 32-bit integer. And so each array element, in this case, this lower right one, with a value of 12 is an integer. Uh, and the data space for this is 2D 5 by 3. This is an example of a slightly more complicated one. Still, the data space is identical, still two-dimensional, five by three. But now the data type is much more complicated. It's this compound type, again, like a struct, um, with four fields. One is an unsigned 16-bit integer. One is a character. One is a 32-bit signed integer. And the other one is a, a field that's kind of nested in a way. It's, its type is array type, and the base type for that three-dimensional array type field is a 32-bit float. So maybe it's like a ma matrix in the application somehow. They're storing these four fields, and one of them happens to be a matrix field. All at that identical type. Hey, Quincy, may I interject here for a minute? Sure. We're getting some questions on, um, and before we get too much further down the road that I think maybe you could quickly address now. Um, sure. Sure. The first one was back on slide 13, which is what's the upside of specifying a max size instead of leaving data spaces unlimited as unlimited and what optimization does that buy you? That's exactly correct. It's for optimizations. Um, when you fix the dimensionality of an array, so it's um, the maximum size is the current size, say then you can store the elements much more efficiently on disk if that's your goal is just to store a giant array boom you can do it at once when you uh, specify an unlimited dimension hdf5 sensibly enough requires you to break that up into what we call chunks subsets of the data set um, so that it can be extended easily otherwise you'd have to read in the entire data set and allocate some new space for it that was big enough to hold the extension and then write it back out and be terrible. So there is a, a slight um, performance penalty for choosing an unlimited dimension if all you want to do is write out the entire data set. And I'll cover this a little bit more about chunking later on. But that's the basic sense of it is that if you have a very straightforward application, you would want to choose fixed dimensions because you can write the entire data set out at once in one giant IRO. And then was there anything in the session? Yeah, yeah, and then two more slides forward on slide 15. Uh, the question is, is there really support com complex numbers? There is a good question. We've talked about that, and the C standards have encompassed complex numbers as a basic data type for the C standards and have discussed implementing it in HDF5, but unfortunately haven't in, uh, standardized in an approach. There's been several different um, community supported approaches to storing within a community, uh, you know, physicists or, you know, uh, cosmologists or something, um, defining their own, here's what we think of as a complex number. Uh, but we don't have a standard one currently. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. So I'll pick back up here. We've got a, such a broad 
set of slides to cover this is um, quite a bit of a challenge. So I'm um, going fast. Please do stop me. Um, so, okay, we've got this array in HDF5, and we described it with its data type and its data space. Now we actually need to store those elements in the file. So, as I was alluding to just a couple minutes ago, <clears throat> when you store um, a fixed dimensionality array, you can do it contiguously in the file very fast um, if all you're ever going to do is write that out. You can also break up that <clears throat> data set um, into what we call chunks, uh, so that array is stored in subsets in the file. And it gives you several advantages. As I said earlier, it's extensible. And if you are accessing a subset um, repeatedly uh, in your application, it's very advantageous to store that subset as the chunk size for HDF5 and then be able to just access in those subsets along the way. So accessing each chunk is much faster when it's subsetted than accessing and extracting a subset out of a contiguous data set and many more I.O. operations typically, or much less memory use, depending on your point of view. Um, chunking is also required in order to compress data sets. Uh, this obviously reduces their storage size and slinging them around the network is also faster in that case as well. There are three other ways to store a data set, and these are a little more esoteric, requiring special situations, probably. If you have very tiny data sets, you know, two by threes, but you still want them to be data sets and then attributes, maybe you want to store them compactly along with the metadata and the header. Maybe you've got data in another file and you want to point at it. And so inside the HDF5, you tell it, well, my data is external. Please look for it over there in that other file. And you can also compose a data set, what we call a virtual data set, out of data sets stored in many other HDF5 files. Um, and that allows you to present a view into a, um, a set of source data sets. Lots of times these are used for light sources to gather a single coherent view from many cameras at different, you know, at the same time. So how do we organize all these data sets? Well, we use HDF5 groups and links. So I've got all these data sets in the file. I clearly don't want to just put them all at the root of the file. That would be very messy. Instead, I like to create some kind of grouping hierarchy to organize them, say, hey, these data sets over here are for visualization. These over here are my checkpoint files from my simulation. They share, because I've got two links pointing at it, this latitude, longitude, temperature data set. Um, so you, you're allowed to create what we call hard links, right, to a shared data set. Groups, as we show on the, on the right, um, out of that sim out to the right, have, can point at objects in other files. So they call those external links out to other objects in other files. And everything is tied together nicely. You start at the root group and you proceed from there. Um, so the final smallest uh, main uh, object in HDF5 are attributes, and we use those for metadata typically. Typically, the user is writing metadata into their file and describing some level of provenance or um, parameter settings in, in various ways about their groups and data sets. So they're very similar to key values. Every attribute has to be unique for a given object. You can have the same attribute name on different objects. Um, and they're very similar to data sets. They have a value. Um, you have to describe the data type and data space. But we don't do partial I.O. on them. They're, they can't be compressed. You can't extend them. And they're designed to be kind of small um, bits of metadata on top. If you really had something scale size, you probably want a data set. So that's the data model parts of things. And here is where I normally pause for questions. Are there anything? Has anything else come up, Ashley? Yeah, we had a question back on slide sure. 21. Uh, okay. And that is, why can't you link parts of data sets, like one column in one data set to another row in a different data set? That's a great idea. Uh, we've discussed having either a column-oriented structure in HDF5 where you could store those kind of broken out, and there's some advantages to that. And if you did that, then you'd be able to share maybe columns between data sets. Um, right now, that's not possible. 
uh, the, the, it's not really a limitation, I would say, of the data model, but you could emulate it in a couple of ways. You could create a data set that was just a column. It's similar to this green one in the middle with the latitude, longitude, and temperature, and then maybe it just contains latitudes. And then share that from multiple groups to indicate that those um, pieces of your data model, the user's data model, both accessed or all accessed that uh, component of it. Probably the closest thing that I can think of right now. And so one more question, and you may mm -hmm. have already answered this one. I was mm -hmm. dealing with some technical issues in the beginning, but will there ever be HDF6 right. and will it be compatible with HDF5? We get that one too, because when you have a number, everyone says, well, there could be another number. Um, and we, we, uh, we don't anticipate ever moving to something that we would call HDF6. Um, we upgrade the file format periodically, but our goal is to always make the current software be able to access every file that's been created ever. Um, may eventually draw the line at like, yeah, that's more than 20 years old. You're going to have to kind of run a little tool to upgrade it so that the current software and the current library can understand it. Um, but the file format was designed from the very beginning to be able to be updated and, and refreshed with new capabilities and new ideas incrementally without ever needing to go to an HDF6, per se. So, no, I hope not. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thanks. All right, so we'll pick back up here at the software. And um, going very fast and probably may not get to the end of everything that we've got slides about. But if you visit the HDF5 uh, homepage at the HDF group, there's hundreds of web pages, dozens and dozens of examples, and lots and lots of great stuff to draw on documentation, examples, tutorials, all there. So here, um, for HDF5, the current version that uh, was released late last year was uh, 1.10.5. So if your current system isn't running that, you can always ask people to upgrade. 1.10.6 is coming along soon, however. Um, the main library for HDF5 is written in C. Uh, it was old, and we decided not to write it in what was not standardized yet. The C++ standard was still evolving. But there are bindings for C++, Fortran, Java, any other language you want. Great ones for Python. Um, Perl, Ruby, Ada, whatever, you know, anything. Everybody's written a, a wrapper around HDF5. If you've got a, a, a language that's your favorite, you probably can find a wrapper for it. The distribution comes with these um, command line tools that are allowed, uh, provided to give you basic capabilities to look at the files that are produced and kind of poke around in them to figure out uh, what sort of information is there. and uh, give you basic information about them. I mean, text line tools are not going to be your friend with gigabyte sized files, um, but they'll give you the right structure of the file, even if you don't want to read all the data set elements about that line. Pre-built binaries are provided on the website as well. Um, they do um, want you to install SZIP and Zlib so that they can correctly uh, access compressed data with the libraries that are provided there. But you can build your own. It's a very easy build process. The very first thing you might want to do if somebody gives you an HDF5 file is, well, what is in this file? Run H5 dump on the file, and you can display the very high-level concept um, contents of the file. If you're beginning to do HDF5 programming yourself, uh, maybe you want to use one of the wrapper scripts, like H5CC or the C++ or Fortran ones. And these just bundle the uh, header files and libraries together so you can write very nice, simple examples and uh, get started without having to remember how to link your application together with HDF5. Uh, also, the Java browser is excellent. Um, if you've got a file and you want a GUI that can display the structure of that file, uh, this is a great place to start. And hundreds of examples, as I mentioned here at this location. So quick overview of the programming uh, API. And again, I can do no justice to this um, in the 10 minutes or so we've got allocated at this presentation. But from a high level, oh goodness, sorry. Okay. Sorry, that's usually my wife saying, hey, you need to do something, I'm going to message her. Um, 
Hey, Quincy, are there Julia wrappers? There are Julia wrappers. Thank you for asking. Um, so, sorry, hopefully that will be okay. There's lots of uh, API wrappers at the top with language interfaces, as I say here. Um, high level API is written on top of them. Some of them are nicely domain specific. I, I point out the uh, NetCDF4 one that has a nice climate focused set of um, APIs that are used very heavily in the climate community and then all across the way people build things on top of hdf5 to kind of abstract it a little bit more and there's a ton of things internally and then there's a bottom level of you can plug things in here at the bottom uh, in the virtual file uh, driver level as well as some other places so um, talk a little bit more about this as we go generally speaking when you look at the hdf5 api because it's written in c um, the routines will begin with a prefix, right? Our namespace, in a sense, is H5. And then the next character is um, corresponds to the type or class of the object that the function is acting on. H5. Ds are data sets, Fs are files, S is data spaces. So all the um, operations on those kinds of objects will start with those prefixes. It is a very, very large API. Um, you know, we rival MPI in a lot of ways. There's hundreds of API routines, but you can get a lot done with a pretty simple set of routines to begin with, and then just kind of go, oh, that's interesting, or I need this capability, and let's see if the uh, documentation provides me something. So your core per paradigm is very C-oriented, right? There is no constructors for you. You actually have to do all this yourself. You create your object, you access it, you close it. Um, if you want to change that behavior somehow, we use uh, what we call properties. These are very similar to MPI info objects. They let you tweak the underlying behavior, and sometimes in very important ways for HDF5. A very high-level skeleton of what your programming will look like is something like this. You'll create or open your file, create a data space that defines the arrayness of your data set, um, create that data set, read or write to it, and then close everything back down. The reason why you create data spaces here and not necessarily data types is that we can predefine some data types. Well, 32-bit floats are a really standard thing, but I have no idea, you know, the library, the HDF5 library has no idea what you mean by an array. We can't provide a predefined every single size of a two-dimensional array for you. So you actually have to define, hey, I have a two-dimensional array and it's 110 by 47, um, and then plug that into your data set create routine, along with the predefined data type for floating point. That's very simple. So other very common ones that you'll use um, when you're writing your first few programs, you want to select subsets with hyperslab and element selections. You may want to retrieve this data space for a data set can construct new data types with um, HFT create or some of these other routines, build and access groups with HFG routines, and then annotate data sets and groups with the A create open write read write, and change properties of all of these things, change aspects of how they're stored. Maybe you're setting your chunking sizes on your data sets where you want it to be compressed with deflate um, with properties. I'll show some of the examples for parallel programming will we'll use these property nests in a way that makes that a little more obvious. So any other baseline HDF5 questions for programming? Sorry, I had to get off mute. I think we did have one, uh, let's see. I think someone's answering them though right now. Um, but back on slide 25, there was a question about, do you support reviewing bindings for other programming languages? Um, reviewing, I don't know what that would mean. Um, as kind of a general sense of what do you think about my language binding for my fancy new language? Um, yeah, sure, we probably could take a look at those kind of things, you know, the HDF group or the, the um, 
Exit HDF5 team in general uh, across the labs um, would be interesting. I don't know that it depends on what how in depth that was going. So you can get in touch with uh, probably the HDF group team, help at hdfgroup.org uh, is a good place to start for those kind of questions. Okay. And then someone is typing one right now. <laughs> Um, and I think the, the gist is, for writing lots of unit tests, can one mock HDF5 files and objects without writing to disk? In a way, yes. Um, HDF5 has what we call a core, as in old style memory, uh, file driver. So you can specify that you'd like to use the core file driver when you create a file. And it will just allocate a buffer in memory. And then you can make modifications on it. Actually, all the operations occur just like you were doing reads and writes to the file. And then when you close it, poof, it can either go away or you can write it out a copy of that result to the file system if you wanted to. But you could very easily never touch the file system if you didn't want to. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's one more question. And is a, is a parallel file system required for parallel parallel I.O. of files? I strongly recommend it. I'll, I'll tell you a little debugging story, whoever is asking. Um, you can't, uh, MPI, MPitch, for example, um, supports accessing files on NFS partitions um, through MPI. Um, so you can write what you think is parallel I.O and MPI will do its very best to make sense of writing that to your NFS mounted file. But I had, I was running a very simple test that took tiny fractions of a second on a real parallel file system or even the local disk. And all the locking required on that NFS um, partition stretched it out to over two minutes to write that file out. So hundred or a thousand times worse performance um, if you don't use a good parallel file system. That's a cautionary tale. So there are a few more questions. You tell me, do you want me to go ahead and ask them or do you need to continue on and we'll just answer these as part of the transcript? Boy, hard to know. Um, I think a couple of these are easy. So um, okay. when, sure. I'll go ahead and you. when using the Fortran interface, the array dimensions are transposed. Is, are there additional mm -hmm. arguments to change that at read write time or when creating the data space? Yeah, we've had that question come up for, well, a couple of decades now. Um, the general, and I'm not a great Fortran guy, but we have great Fortran people on the team. And the arrangement that we set up for the Fortran and C interface is that just do what makes sense to you in Fortran and just do what makes sense to you in C and the library will map between the two and it should be transparent to your application. So just do the right thing for your Fortran code. It will be okay, is the right answer. Okay, and then here's the last one. It's my sure. understanding the number of fields in a compound data type is limited by the object header size. Is there any workaround for this? That is a very knowledgeable person. Yes, technically, yes. Um, it would be great to expand that size and um, it's not technically hard. It just requires a few months of manpower and a little bit of funding behind that, obviously. Um, I don't think we've got an explicit mandate from any funding source um, to, to do that right now. Um, on the other hand, it's an open source project. And if you would like, I mean, we're happy to advise, like, hey, I want to add this feature. We can give you some advice about how you would try to do that. Um, and so if you, if someone would like to try doing it on their own, I don't want to close off the open source part of it, right? I'm not necessarily expecting this person to fix it, but just in general, it's open source. If you really desperately want a feature and have the desire to do it yourself, you can. Uh, but I don't know any funding sources that are going to expand that header size right now. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So from parallel HDF5 now. So, um, Parallel uh, HDF5 access is very similar. It's designed to be almost the same as serial um, with taking advantage of um, the serial interfaces. So we use MPI underneath uh, the cover. Uh, all the files are exactly identical that you would produce on a serial application, just hopefully faster. Um, 
and you can port those between serial and portable, I'm sorry, parallel um, platforms without any problems one way or the other. You can create a little skeleton on your laptop and upload it to the supercomputer and then run your simulation up there. It works just fine. So there's a few extra little calls that you have to make in order to like really extract the performance you'd like. And there's a few restrictions and etiquette, if you'd like, on how you make those operations when you use parallel HDFI. So this is the typical skeleton I showed this earlier. And when you look at that in code in a little bit more detail level, um, and I'm only showing the create part, not the closing up part, um, create a file with what is here, the, the default property list, um, create that data space, create a data set using that data space, and then write your data to that file or to that data set. That's what a typical serial program will look like. And when you add in the parallel side of things, somewhere up in the application, it has to call MPI init, and eventually it calls finalize. And so all of these calls have to occur between those two, right? typical for an MPI application. But then the extra things you need to do for HDF5, you need to create a file access property list with HIP create. You need to tell HDF5, by the way, um, even though I'm on a supercomputer and I could create that file in serial, I, I want you to create a shared file across all my MPI processes. And you do that by calling this set file access property list, or we call them FAPLs, um, with the communicator and the MPI info, info objects that you want to use when you're accessing that file. Lots of times this is com world. You don't have to use a separate one here. You can just put MPI com world and MPI info null, right? Um, and then, as opposed to we did in serial with the default property list, we use that property list here when we create the file. It says, hey, I want to use a special access mode when I operate on this file. Then you create your data space, create your data set the same way. But now, in order to extract the performance we'd like, we want to do collective I.O. on this data set. So we create another property list, a different kind, a data set transfer property list. And we set a property on that property list that says, hey, I'd really like you to do collective I.O. when I write or read to this data set and then use that property list and transfer property list when I make this call in your data set read or write call. If you don't specify that in your data set read or write, you by default get independent I.O. Um, so it's requirement that you specify an extra uh, property and pass, pass in that property list when you want to do collective I.O. to a data set. What that looks like, you know, to your, your application is going to run across all these compute nodes. You'll make calls and specify and like that to be collective um, to HDF5. We talk to MPI. It talks to the parallel file system, creates a single shared file across that parallel file system. And if you're using Luster, you probably want to enable your striping factor to be much larger than the default. Many systems set the default to be one or something very small. But if you've got a lot of compute nodes operating on this file, you want to set that to be maybe the maximum for the system. It's usually a couple hundred, um, but certainly much larger than one. You don't want only one um, server, file system server, to be trying to handle all the, the um, operations for this particular file. You want to set that to be much broader and much more parallel. And then eventually it drops down into the network and the IO sends it off to the file system. So the etiquette side of things, you know, the proper way that you're going to operate on an HDF5 file. Um, as I said, parallel HDF5 opens that shared file. We use the communicator that you pass in. Um, give you back the file handle so it looks just like a normal file ID to your application. But now all your processes that are going to make collective API calls, they all have to participate. Um, you can open different files with different communicators and different subsets of your processes, but if everybody is joined in in that original open, those are the processes that need to participate. And one of the restrictions that is a key to changing HDF5 structure, the group uh, structure for an HDF5 file. So anytime you change that group structure, the hierarchy of objects in the file, you have to make those changes collectively. 
Uh, we're working on some capabilities to remove that restriction, allow you to make independent changes to the file structure. But for the moment, and historically, that set of modifications with those APIs that change the structure are uh, required to be collected. And this, this link will tell you all the ones that are required to be collected. Basically, if you create or change anything in the namespace of the file, not just writing data, like with the data set read or write call, but anything else that modifies the group or um, attribute structure of the file, you have to make it collectively. And so what does collective mean, right? It's collective um, attempts to combine those smaller independent IO operations into fewer, hopefully larger ones. And it's not always a win one way or the other. Usually collective is a good win, but there are certainly important use cases where independent is better and you may want to use it. Um, we operate with the same definition of collective as MPI does. Um, everybody that was part of that communicator when we, in this case, opened the file, um, they have to participate in those collective calls. And you got to do them in the right order, otherwise you get essentially written lock inversions, right? If process one is calling A then B, process two has to do the same thing. If you reached B then A on process two, you'll hang. It will be sitting there and waiting for something on call A when you're in call B and process two and you'll never get to the other order. Um, these collective calls are not always synchronous. They may not always synchronize your, your independent MPI processes. Um, and they don't always require communication. It just possibly means that we're changing the internal state of the, in our case, file um, or the communicator in general. In our case, it's the file. These are the, when you change the namespace of the file, we may not communicate with everybody. We may not um, synchronize at that point but everybody's got to keep the same view of what the contents of the file are. And so those are collected. So ton of examples here in the parallel IO tutorial. Uh, I recommend that highly for a much more in depth than I can get in five or 10 minutes. But if there's any questions, um, this is also a good point to stop. So your colleague has been very helpful in keeping up with the answers to other questions in the Google Doc. So I think we'll let okay. you continue on. Okay, that's great, thanks. So, great, um, you've written your MPI application, you've, you've decided to use HDF5, and you wanna do this in a high performance way. How do you do that? What are the diagnostics or instrumentation aspects of HDF5 that can help you and may frustrate you unless you know how to debug them? Let's be frank here, right? Um, so when we talk about data and metadata IO in the next few slides. Obviously data is the problem size stuff. It's probably stored in an HDF5 data set. The IO is independent or collective. And your general goal is to not write a lot. Um, and you wanna choose an appropriate layout. If you're doing subsets and you can tune them to chunk sizes, that's great. That might be the right thing. Um, you also want to kind of balance out things and make certain that the alignment of gigabyte size blocks is a nice file system boundaries if you can uh, arrange that for your application. Metadata obviously is much smaller. Um, they can be independent or collective, but that's only for reading if you're just accessing and opening things. If you modify anything, again, it's got to be collective or your app will hang, I guarantee you. Um, and if you're doing metadata, you want to structure things into kind of bundles of metadata and probably create a few fewer attributes and not a million attributes. Um, if you can, and you don't have a large legacy uh, situation, you want to use the latest library versions to read and write the latest versions of the file format. They're generally more optimized for every case we can think of. Um, and if necessary, and I don't normally recommend this, um, do some tuning on our, our metadata caching. We do a lot of caching and it's possible we got something wrong, but that's pretty unusual. I wouldn't go there first. So also when you're doing tuning, there's a lot of layers in our stack, right? We're doing HDF5 and maybe even a wrapper layer on top of HDF5 that's a little more domain specific, maybe not CDF4 on top of HDF5. And then we write through MPIIO, which has its own set of tuning parameters, the, the file system has its own tuning parameters, striping and these kind of things. 
And it's possible that the storage hardware is an issue, but it's more than likely in one of these software layers that you need to adjust. But thinking about it, well, HDF5 is broken, so well, maybe it's an MPI setting that you need. So I am going to, in the name of time, kind of skip over these slides. I, I really recommend people to take a look at them, but I don't think I can get all the way through the uh, sets of examples that are here in a timely manner, I don't think. So skipping past these guys, except to get kind of to the summary of Collective I.O. is good, and if you can align your chunks with your access patterns, that's also super helpful. Uh, you know, we after this kind of tuning set of slides, if you look through that, it's pretty straightforward. Um, scalability was basically flat. This is the right thing to do. Um, generally speaking, you may want to also run some other performance measurement capabilities. Um, there's some tools that we provide called H5 Perf. It's a command line tool in the HDF5 source distribution. And Darshan from Argon is also super useful. Um, lots of very good information that you can extract from Darshan and um, tell you a lot about the I.O. patterns you're doing. Are you writing big blocks from memory straight into disk? Are you writing contiguous in memory and scattering? Are you gathering? Which, whichever is going on. But you want to figure out those things. Um, HIF Perf will help tell you what those are. I could say it lets you measure serial I.O. performance against parallel performance, you can see the bandwidth goes up a lot when you go from uh, independent to collective, basically the left hand of these little uh, bars to the right hand. Props for Darshan, excellent, very useful. Uh, we work with their team uh, whenever we can. And we've got some future work planned to integrate HDF5 uh, operations more directly in there, which would be great. Um, Darshan output, I'm going to skip through. Uh, we're running in time. I'll spend a couple minutes on this and then we'll get into the next set of features and things. So, uh, cannot overemphasize the spend the data write changes to the namespace. Um, it has to be collective. Your app will hang and you'll be very confused because it'll be later. It'll be like 500 calls later in HDF5 where the cache needs to be changed. And now we try to synchronize our caches um, and it'll hang. And you're like, well, what happened? And why is it hanging here? Uh, this is probably the root. So don't do different creates on different ranks of your or modifications on different ranks. Opens, totally fine. But we, we have this interesting problem where even if metadata reads are independent, sometimes you want them to be collective because when you open a data set with this path, I give error slash g1 slash g2 slash data set one, d1. Um, every single process is going to go to disk and look up, you know, the, the path traversal to get down to that data set. And then it's going to read in the, the header information, the metadata about that data set in order to open it. Um, every process, right? Hundreds of thousands of processes are going to go access this bit of data. Um, you know, bits of metadata from the file system. And it's like a denial of service attack on your file system. So what you want to do is set this um, all collective metadata ops property that I list here to tell HDF5, by the way, you can save the file system here. Um, I'm going to be opening or whatever uh, metadata operation on all the processes. You are allowed to read it on one of them. We use MPI rank zero and then broadcast it to the other ranks. And we leverage just, you know, we do a tiny read on one from one rank and we use the interconnect to go get that over to everybody else. Everybody wins. File system wins, your app goes much faster, everything is a great thing. And you can set this on the file level if you expect that you're doing a restart on a simulation dump and everybody's gonna go lockstep and read everything in. You can do it when you open the file, or you can do it on an individual file operation. Everybody's going to open this data set together, but maybe not that other data set. And finally, um, I mentioned earlier, hey, you'd love to do collective I.O. And it, it maybe sounds a little cautious, like I'm saying, you'd like to do collective I.O. 
and that's exactly what happens. You may like to do collective I.O., but there's times when HDF5 either doesn't have the capability or it would be extremely performance penalty to um, go ahead and try to arrange for collective I.O. to occur. If you're going to do data type conversions like float to double or something like that, input to output, um, or you're doing some kind of data other data transform or your layout isn't contiguous or chunked, these and a few other reasons um, can force HDF5 to say, well, I can't do that. And sometimes I can't do that right now. We just need to you know, change a feature, add some more, do some more work to add a capability. But right now, can't do that. I could you know, change this collective IO request that you made down into an independent one. And you want to check for that after your data set write. You say, hey, I like this to be collective. So that's the setup part of this before the data set write. But then after the data set write, you can query on that transfer ID, uh, the transfer property list to extract the IO mode. What, what kind of IO mode did you actually use? I asked for collective, but if it's not collective, then you can say, hey, get the non-collective cause. Why did you break uh, my collective IO into independent IO? And then you can look at the flags that are set in that local and global collective cause um, to show whether that is something you can fix or change in your application and really get the benefits of collective IO, um, or you will need to find some way to, to work with this being done independently. This is an important part of tuning your application, I would say. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the features that are coming up for the ECP project itself. Um, we're running short on time. Any more questions or is everybody doing okay on the um, chat window? Um, so far, we have been able to address all the answers in the Google Docs. For those that um, are asking them, just look there for your answers and we'll keep going. Okay, that's great, thanks. So, um, ECP XHDF5 is funded by the ECP project, obviously why we're here today. Um, our goals are to work with the ECP applications and the facilities to meet their needs, to productize the features that we develop over the course of this project, um, and then to support and maintain these into the future, right? We, we, we're going to deliver exascale systems someday, and we want to use them for quite a while. Uh, we also have some components of this project that are interesting explorations of future, uh, you know, object storage or advanced uh, node local um, memory, these kinds of things as well. So uh, this is an eye chart. Largely, we are working with a large number of uh, application teams already. Happy to talk to anyone who's interested as well. And um, work together to see if we can help meet your needs or answer questions or optimize your application once you're uh, also engaged with kind of horizontally um, the other software and technology teams um, in the io space in a lot of ways also visualization apps too with alpine um, compression here with uh, the couple of compression teams so Two um, features that are on the uh, on the deck for this year are this virtual object layer and indexing and querying on the raw data in HDF5 files. We'll talk a little bit about that. So the virtual object layer we call it Vol, right? Um, is to provide a way for the data model and the API to be common, but maybe the bottom half changes, so you can write new plugins to target upcoming future uh, file systems. Maybe it's a object store system, um, Deos or DDN's Red or one of these other new ones. Maybe it's a remote access, a cloud or something else that fits your needs. It's not always a DOE application. Um, or it's a different file format. You wanna keep using HDF5 at the top, but you have some legacy data that's in NetCDF or Adios's BP format or whichever. Um, and you can write a plugin that addresses those and accesses those. Uh, these are currently uh, available. Um, the, the virtual object layer is available on the HDF5 Git repo and will be included in the upcoming 1.12 release um, a little bit later, hopefully this summer. Indexing and querying. 
uh, very straightforward, very database-like in a way. We've taken a little while to get here, but it's a, a, a highly requested feature. So we want to create queries on HDF5 files or maybe across many files and then execute those to say, hey, tell me the locations within the data sets where it meets these criteria. So you create a query. You maybe combine several queries to say, you know, I want it to be greater than 10 and less than 50 or greater than 100 and less than 150. And then apply that query to a data set or many data sets, get the results, and then you can throw in your query, but uh, look at the results in some way, usually with selection IOs and HDF5. And then obviously underneath that, if you just had to keep reprocessing the data set many times to do many queries, that would get very slow. You want to create indices underneath that to be able to do much more accelerated queries uh, against the data sets that have an index. So we're also implementing a pluggable architecture that allows us to do those things. So these are the two major upcoming features that we've got a, a, a firm handle on. And I would also say that, uh, well, I'll get to it later about asynchronous IOs. But um, the other component that is a very strong um, aspect of the ECP project is doing support and maintenance, helping out uh, application teams and providing them with both documentation and current releases and answers to questions, all of which is available here. And I, I really highly recommend if you have a question, start with the help desk. Uh, there's someone there all day long, uh, every week, and send them an email or post something on the forum. Those are probably the two best ways to get started as a um, route into getting some help about things. Also, well, like I say here, point of contact for us, for our team, but I really kind of recommend the help desk or the forum is a better place to go. So other new features that we're focusing on for exascale architectures, um, several different ways to take more advantage of upcoming system features, topology aware, like what is the connectivity of the interconnect and the storage system? How do we use uh, burst buffer most effectively or node local storage? Um, single writer, multiple reader means kind of that. You have an application producing data and you want to concurrently monitor and access that data in the HDF5 file simultaneously to its production. Um, asynchronous IO, we actually had a milestone two weeks ago that delivered this to allow HDF5 applications to do fully asynchronous uh, metadata and data set operations in the HDF5 containers. I uh, talked about querying. Interoperability is through the ball there. Again, you can access uh, Adios and um, NetCDF uh, file formats with some of the projects that we're working on right now. I think, oh, well, here's got more details about data delivery, but I'm just about out of time. I'm gonna kind of recommend that people take a look at these. There's some excellent work that the performance is really very, very good on first buffer-like scenarios. Topology aware again, how do we take advantage of those um, system specific things that we want to do? I'm going to I've covered these already. This is the overall roadmap, what we expect that to be designed, deployed, and released. Um, so right now we're working on these independent metadata updates um, for delivery later this year, along with the querying we've delivered on this full swimmer ball asynchronous work and upcoming in the future we've got a few more things and then some new tasks for the second phase of ecp projects which we have here um i'm just about out of time throwing a plug for another project that we've uh, funded through oscar uh, to monitor and implement features for uh, experimental and observational data uh, through mostly uh, DOE facilities so that uh, light sources and telescopes and all kinds of things that produce streams of basically real-time data can, um, can use HDF5 in productive and useful things as well. A couple more things here, but I'm about out of time. Um, any final questions or, or wrap up, um, Asha? No, your partner has been um quickly typing away. So I think we're, I think we're <laughs> good there. Okay.
Yeah, right. That was um, Surin. That was Surin, uh, Ashley. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Surin. Yeah. Oh, actually, it was Elena, oh, Elena okay. Forma from HCF Group. Oh, great. I see. Thanks, well, thank you. <laughs> so yes, I'll be asking. Uh, we'll be asking the uh, presenter and all folks in the in the team to go through the questions again and you know mm -hmm. do some cleanup and make them available to people. Ash Ashley, would you uh, give me uh, the screen? Mm -hmm. You got it. Oops. Something here. Yes, with that, thank you, uh, Quincy, for, for the uh, for the uh, the webinar for presenting the webinar thank you all for participating so again we have this uh, survey that would like to ask you uh, it doesn't take long maybe just a minute to give us some feedback so we can improve the series uh, the slides and recording will be available uh, next week uh, you have in those two links and I'd like to announce the next webinar in the series that's going to be in about a month that's uh, on April the 10th and the topic will be, uh, the webinar will be on testing Fortran software with PF unit. Uh, this webinar will be presented by Thomas Kloon from NASA Goddard. With that, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Ashley? Thanks.